All the words and pictures in the film you're about to see are taken directly from the autobiography of Jerome Myers titled Artist in Manhattan. Born in Virginia in 1867, Myers first entered the art field painting theatrical backdrops in New York City. Later he studied at Cooper Union in the Art Students League. He began to show at the Macbeth Gallery in 1900 and his work was immediately successful. Meyer's art captured the life of the city he loved so well, particularly its immigrant population and the richness of their lives. Caught in an immense swirl of people at a fiesta in New York's east side, I remember standing with my back against a stable door. The street was ablaze with festoons of colored lights. The street shrine gloriously outlined against the night sky. I saw two angels suspended on ropes worked by half-naked figures on opposite sides of the street. Seeming to fly through the air above, they were throwing flowers down on the uplifted faces. The spirit of the Lord had descended to the crowd, and the crowd was the spirit of the Lord, made human and manifest. Yet in this surging crowd were politicians smoking black cigars, subway laborers whose bare breasts gleamed with sweat, mothers whose antique faces stood carved in the electric light, and happy children with ruffled dresses gay with the colors of the rainbow, their voices in song. With music and fireworks, the angels above threw down their little gifts, and the angels below marched solemnly past my stable door. Directly, I ventured out to interpret life for myself, to render the impression of the city and the people that I really cared for. With a pencil, at first timid and faltering, I adapted my line to what I saw. Then gradually becoming more assured, my line began automatically to react to my feeling. Life at a quiet moment, in a quiet by street, where the poor carry on, where boy and girl grow up and are married, their children to romp on the same sidewalks. It is not for me to say that conditions are not better in the beautified and modern New York of today, yet I feel that the free play of children is more rare and I know that picturesque types are seen less often. Up goes the flying tambourine, gaily a Sicilian melody is ground out by the organ. The art of music is ground out for the hearts of people at their everyday tasks, for the children who are always responsive to this colorful, tuneful feast. In this way, along the curbstones of New York, the children are brought up on the operas of Verdi as well as on the popular tunes they can dance to. The curb was a market of constant barter, and in the early morning the rush was on. Packed together, neck to neck, people bought and sold from the pushcarts laden with fruits and vegetables. There is time to gossip between sales, to exchange daily histories, to keep warm the human contact. Hardships and privations, while sharpening their wits, have yet not dulled the humor of these people in a fervid life in which the concern of one is the concern of all. The logical result of common persecutions now past, forgotten in the symphonic freedom of New York's East Side. In the New York of today, something is gone, something is missing, 
I say to myself, it is the warmth of human contact. That's what it is. It has gone. Men and women and children hide behind the walls of their homes. New Yorkers no longer live in the open. Tenement rooms can be measured almost in inches. The inches becoming still smaller as the family grows. But outdoors, on the pavements of the open street, there need be no measuring rod any more than for the flowering meadows. Almost like a forgotten melody, I remember the concerts in the beautiful mall in Central Park. The blue dome studded with stars, its fluted columns in gold and arabesque. Regularly, for hours before the concert, real lovers of music would gather to compete for the first row of benches, passing the time in discussion of their favorite compositions. To the children, it was an occasion to sit with the grown-ups and join them in listening to hear those mysterious sounds that the uniformed musicians blew out of their golden horns. And far across the city was the unpretentious little theater on Third Avenue. In those summer afternoons, children here too gave their rapt attention to the stage show, their mothers no less innocent in their enjoyment of the entertainment. In those days, before the river highways had nibbled away the picturesque fringe of city life, with its miles of tenements throbbing with life, the docks were swimming holes, where the kids of the neighborhood enjoyed the swell from the excursion boats on their way to Providence, Rhode Island. A contented people, enjoying their makeshift river park, blissfully unaware that the automobile would soon be whirling continuously over their hallowed grounds and that the city of tomorrow would engulf them. The heat of the day has turned to the cool of the night. The ocean breezes sift through the bay around the wide curve of the East River, passing over the recumbent forms, east side forms, men, women, and children, whole families asleep in this vast earthen penthouse of the poor. Industrious people, enjoying their night of cool river breezes to buoy them up again for the day's work. These types are not to be judged too hastily. There is repose in this solitude, a solitude on the edge of great Manhattan. Watching this muted drama of the night, I thought of these lives as I had observed them in their daily rounds. Now looking back at those years, so much has changed, so much has passed, never to return. too harsh with the city. Don't say it's just rows of concrete chimneys with windows in them. Put down how I still love New York. It still has charm. Now in the spring, people will find it. <laughs> 